So, welcome here. Welcome everybody. Uh, we are very happy to see all of you on our upcoming webinar. My name is Jarka Turkova. I work as a consultant and psychologist for assessment systems uh, already for over eight years. My background is in personality assessment uh, and my specialty is namely Hogan uh, assessments. Hello everyone, my name is Dora Magyaroshi. I am also a consultant in Assessment Systems Hungary and Assessment Systems Group, of course. Uh, I'm also a psychologist. I have been also working here since eight years now, so quite the same as Jarka. I will be co-hosting uh, this webinar uh, and my uh, specialty here in our company is that I'm the ACDC International Product Manager in our group. And a part of us, there is one more colleague of ours who helped making this happen, our colleague Barbara, who is uh, behind the scenes helping us with, uh, with organizing the tool. Um, and today, what, what is the purpose of this 60 minutes? What you can be looking forward to is the fact uh, we all are realizing that uh, we are moving on uh, with what's going on right now uh, with, uh, with the needs uh, the working market now has uh, related to the COVID situations. Um, and we are adapting. And one of the things we need to take into consideration is working online. And uh, we will be talking about online competencies uh, that are becoming more and more important these days and also how to access them. And not only that, but also about moving your HR processes uh, related to selection and development online, because these things still have to happen, regardless of where we work, if we are home, if we are in the office, if we are half in the office and half somewhere else, we still need to manage these things. And for that, we will of course need valid tools, something that will do the job for us uh, reliably, uh, so that we can be sure we are doing the right thing uh, with, uh, with working with people who are now uh, the most important asset for us to uh, get through uh, the whole situation related to COVID. Why we decided to organize our webinar is that basically our world has changed as most of you have noticed and this still changing. So we, we tend to call it, it's a post pandemic era, but we are still living in it right now. And we work online, most of people work online or at least partly, partly online. And we are online right now as well. Uh, and of course, some uncertain changing situations uh, came with this, with this whole new era as well. Uh, what we tend to call new normal, but this is nothing new because you have probably heard uh, previously about the acronym which is called VUCA or volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, uh, which was used to describe the world that we are living not right now, but two years ago. So we are living in the future right now that we wanted to prepare for. Uh, and we tend to think that some new competencies are required for this new era, but well, this is nothing new because we have already needed to prepare for this one. So we like to see it as uh, that some old competencies are needed or at least uh, gain a bigger focus and we are wanting to concentrate on that. Uh, but first of all, we like to ask of your opinion. Uh, so this is time for our first poll right now that uh, to what degree did your organization have to need your employees uh, to coronavirus, to remote work, to coronavirus. Sorry, I can't uh, see the whole question, but yeah, it can be seen. So to what degree did your organization have to move your employees on remote work due to coronavirus? We are really interested in your situation. So if you can vote, please do. Like not at all, partially, or everyone was working from home at one point, and we are still working from home. Please put your votes. I 
And I think most of you have could quote it right now. See the results partially. Well, not no one voted for not at all. So yeah, we were right <laughs> that the world is changing and we have to adapt at least uh, somehow. 43% of you have voted for partially, 29 for everyone was working from home at one point and uh, 29 for we are still working from home. So right now this online thing is, is very, very actual. Thank you for voting for that. So let's move on. That uh, according to uh, McKinsey and Company, uh, according to their study in uh, 2018, they predicted, it was the, the pre-coronavirus era, and they still predicted that for uh, 2030, there will be a high increase, a 25% increase in demand for technological skills, such as programming, but they also meant some, some soft skills as well. So we would like to ask your opinion with the help of a second poll that in your company, what competencies gained a bigger focus in your organization after the first wave? You can choose uh, multiple options. So like uh, the digital savvy or analytical and thinking skills, managing remotely, like leading virtual things, effective and productive working from home, learning agility, uh, general adaptability or emotional intelligence, and you can choose multiple options. So, if you did not vote yet, please do. And I think we can close the poll slowly, but surely we have closed it. And let's see the interesting results. So 85% of you have voted for managing remotely, like leading virtual teams gained a large focus and effective and productive working from home. Yeah, of course. Digital savvy, like 40%, 50% for general adaptability, 50% for emotional intelligence. 20% for learning agility, and a mere 5% for analytical and thinking skills. So based on these results, we can see that uh, the biggest challenge was how to work from home and how to, how to live your usual lives or, or working lives from home. Uh, Forbes uh, conducted a survey very, very recently, like 2020, and they have identified eight job skills that are needed to succeed in a post-coronavirus world, and they quite, quite agree with that, so that is why it is on our slide. And they uh, highlighted that uh, most important skills to succeed in our world right now is adaptability and flexibility, tax savviness, creativity and innovation, data literacy, critical thinking, digital and coding skills, leadership, emotional intelligence, and committing to a lifetime of learning. So these competencies gained a large focus in, in almost all the organizations. I would like to highlight adaptability and flexibility and committing to a lifetime of learning because if you have these two, well, I, can, I think you can succeed in, in all of the others. So you might be thinking, uh, who is the ideal person, the ideal profile uh, to succeed in the new world? Um, we are now coming back uh, to Hogan research and the data uh, Hogan has collected so far. Uh, regardless of actually working on remote or working in present present there are key skills key competencies that are proven to uh, predict uh, leader success uh, or high performer success and it's a 
it's a juice, a combination of certain skills, which are now becoming even more important uh, to succeed. So a part of the new things, there is still a priority and, and still some areas which we need to keep in mind uh, when we are hiring, promoting or developing our people. And it's basically the ability to deal with changes, deal with stress, uh, that's related with changes, the ability to keep clear head and think rationally without being overly emotional or reacting in the way uh, of avoiding the problem or pretending the problem is not here at all. We need realistic and rational uh, leaders who will be able to rationally and realistically evaluate the situation. They still uh, even though the things are changing and maybe their goals are change, changing, they still need to be goal oriented and have the drive and uh, aim for results. Even in situation where you know that the other day can totally change your current perspective and current goals and you always have to readapt and always change uh, in a way your directions. And a part of that, there is an important social part uh, for dealing with other employees, team members, subordinates, uh, other important people around because uh, important social skills such as agreeableness, such as uh, the ability to um, kind of feel for the other people and understand them is very important to connect with them and to be able to manage them even on remote where there is stronger need for understanding, uh, stronger need to reassuring people uh, about what is expected for them or helping them when they are struggling with, with such situations. So in a way we are, uh, we are even now putting a higher priority on these essential skills for high performers, for people who are able to deliver results. Because now even more we need people who can address uncertainty and within this uncertainty, they can still provide a reasonably clear direction uh, in the way that they will still keep uh, positive relationships with others, that they will be able to motivate them and help them move on. And you might say that, well, nobody prepared them for this. We, were, we weren't expecting this to come so far. You, you, if you were looking for um, some scientific articles about working on remote or managing teams on remote, yes, of course, you would find something. But nobody expected it would hit so hard and hit so fast. So uh, one of the things uh, which we believe uh, what is important to take into consideration uh, when working with people and, and selecting them and developing them on remote is still these essential skills needed to be a successful uh, performer and worker, but at the same time, all these things that come on top, uh, all these um, nice things you were mentioning, like managing teams on remote, which will help you fully if, if you uh, have these desired skills or if you have developed these desired skills. But what if the skills are not in there? Yeah. Um, yeah, so as the Hungarians say, there is nothing new under the sun, but right now is the time to show what you have. But at least if you are a leader or a, or a um, key person. Uh, we uh, cite here another study from McKinsey from 2020, so quite a recent study, uh, where they mentioned that uh, when executives uh, made some research, research sorry, internally in their organizations, they, uh, 27, not 28, 87% of them found some skill gaps in the uh, workforce uh, that really needed to be uh, filled in with something. Uh, so they, they found that there are some skills that are missing uh, in their colleagues, in their team, in their employees that needed to, to be developed, but only half of the respondents had a clear sense of how to address this problem. And what they uh, also suggest, all of us, and of course we suggest the same, is to have a clear strategy then how to, 
how to develop your uh, colleagues, how to identify those gaps and how to identify the methods to, to develop them to the desired personality or the desired uh, competency that are desired to, for them to succeed in this new era. So we want to highlight that we, are, we don't want to speak only about selection, we want to speak about development as well, uh, because assessment of skills are not only important uh, when we are selecting new hires, but also important when we want to identify uh, those gaps that we want to develop our colleagues in. What we psychologists like to say that we, we put a diagnosis, which sounds quite scary to, to many of us, but this is what we do. So we want to see the starting point that from where to where we would like to develop our, our colleagues. And for this, we need to use some assessment methods. Uh, and I think this is the time for our third poll that what do you think? What contributes uh, more to job success in the long run when you are hiring or when you are thinking about your current employees? Professional knowledge, soft skills like competency, so like flexibility, adaptability and so on that you have voted about previously, or do you think that both matters equally? So what do you think? What contributes more to job success in the long run? Place your bets. Just a few seconds. And let's see both and soft skills. Well, I'm really happy about this result because uh, this is what we want to communicate. So most of you have voted for soft skills or both matter equally. And I just want to move to the next slide uh, because that's the truth. So if you just uh, check uh, the statistics here that 92% uh, of talent professionals say soft skills matter as much or more than hard skills when they hire, like this LinkedIn study said, then it's quite in line with uh, what we have voted right now. So we are very happy about it because we, we think like the same. And if we are speaking about assessment of skills or competencies, uh, it is needed to clarify that what are we assessing. Uh, so in this nice picture, you can see the structure of competencies that is an iceberg. And, uh, and in HR or in psychology, we like to use iceberg for a lot of things to, to demonstrate. But it is a very nice uh, tool to demonstrate the structure of competencies as well. So when we want to assess competencies, we can target two areas. We can target the behavior uh, that basically are the manif manifestations of competencies, or we can target the underlying characteristics that define how we behave. Just uh, shortly, uh, how we define a competence. A competence uh, is a set of characteristics that enable us to behave in a certain way that is desired to a certain job position or task. So for example, if, our, if we are speaking about the competency called, let's say, customer focus, uh, it means that the person behaves very customer oriented, they are kind and caring, they um, uh, consider or take uh, or pay attention to the customer's needs, they act as the customer's needs in their minds. And in order to be able to behave like that, they, may, they need some underlying characteristics. So it's not just the behavior, but they need to have some potential in order to be able to behave like that. So for example, they need to have some motivation in order to seem helpful or to help the customer or, 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 or help out with, with any kind of problem. And they also need to have some personality characteristics like being kind, being empathetic, being diplomatic. And of course, uh, there are some professional knowledge they need to have, uh, like about the products uh, they are providing customer service on and, and so on. But as science says, it is easier to develop professional knowledge than to develop personality char characteristics or to develop motivation, which we cannot develop. So motivation is, is there or not. 
So what we like to propagate is that if we are targeting competencies with assessment methods, we can target, of course, the, the observable behavior with assessment centers or interviews. And if we want to assess the potential, so whether this person has the potential to be able to behave like that, we need to target motivations and personality because they are there or not, or, or it is very hard to develop them and it's still easier to develop uh, the professional knowledge than the personality characteristics. So we usually say that uh, we measure either potential or measure a current snapshot or, or the uh, observable behavior of the person if we are targeting competencies. But of course, uh, the more the better. So we like to say that if you have the opportunity, it is very beneficial if you, if you measure both of those things. So the observable behavior and the underlying characteristics, because sometimes they might not show similar results, uh, which can have some uh, reasons behind that. Um, yeah, uh, and I would like to give the word to Yarka here. Um, so, thank you. Uh, that was that was for measuring the competencies, or actually, kind of the 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 philosophy of understanding what competencies and, and soft skills are. But when you look at what the companies say, uh, a lot of them actually admit that they struggle recognizing how to use proper ways, uh, how to access, how to evaluate their people in a fair, reasonable um, and transparent matter. So now comes my question on you. Uh, I will need another poll uh, and I will ask you what you personally think makes an assessment valid be it assessment center, be it um, a test you're completing. It could be something that shows the result I expected, I wanted, something that was obvious to me, or the questions, the items inside are relevant for what I'm looking for, or the fact that it costs money and it's not free on the internet. It, do you, you might be thinking that maybe some technical documentation would be nice to have, but maybe it's it's rather boring stuff that you don't really need. Depends on what you think. Maybe you're looking for some return on investment studies. Uh, maybe you look for quality based on what others are using. So you rely that if a massive amount of people will be using something, then it should be right. Or you might rely on psychologists and expect that yeah, whatever psychologists say, let's use it. And, and if there are some data scientists, it should be fine. There's no problem with that. Or you might be thinking that each assessment needs to have some sort of national norm. Uh, maybe you don't need that. Maybe you don't even care that there are some norms. Or you might think uh, of something that seems to work on the long run. So it will, once I see the results, it will tell me uh, the behavior of someone in the future. You can choose whatever questions or whatever combination you want. You can choose none if you want. Uh, and I'm really curious to see the results because I hear from the market and from our clients lots of different aspects they evaluate when they are looking for a certain tool to evaluate. So. Let's have a look at the results. I hope everybody had a chance to put their votes. I see. So nobody put shows results that I expected. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very happy to hear it because, well, first, if it showed us the results that we expect, it wouldn't first, there wouldn't be a reason to use it. And also, um, why would, like, what would be the added value of that? Zero. So. No, we expect uh, the tools to give us some additional uh, questions or additional in input, additional information. There is no, uh, no point or no votes on costs money, which is very interesting. Yes, theoretically, you can, you can be using something that's free of charge to use. Uh, however, 
kind of elaborating and creating a sophisticated tool that has a reasonable quality costs some money and if someone would do it they can do it from from the bottom of their heart to help uh, help the world but uh, most of the times it's something you have to pay for and i wouldn't recommend using something that's available free of charge on the internet because there is no transparency in uh, in how has it been created, what's the reasoning behind, and uh, anybody can download it. So even your candidates and they can prepare for that. The most votes we got uh, was on seems to work on the long run, uh, which is actually an alternative for uh, having ability to predict the future for you which is one of the things I will be mentioning in a while. Uh, and that's, that's really a hit on spot, combined with uh, based on the work of psychologists and data scientists. Now, um, I will kind of be a devil's advocate right now because um, a lot of people can be saying they are psychologists and data scientists, but they actually uh, are not, or they hire one psychologist who will put their name on the method but with no real scientific reasoning behind that. So I would, um, I would maybe make you more aware of the people who are behind each of the assessments, if the people are available to explain you the tool better, if uh, they, how much time they actually dedicated to the work on the tool. Um, because sometimes the, these are some marketing materials that present as scientific data, scientific results, but it's nothing more than a nice combination of, of Photoshop and uh, graph of data on uh, very limited amounts uh, of participants. So just, I will speak about that in a moment. So maybe we can, uh, we can go on because I would like to uh, show you the recommended way of thinking uh, when you're picking an assessment. Fortunately, uh, there are independent organizations who focus or whose job is uh, to evaluate independently uh, in a respectable manner. They are uh, recognized by, uh, by other scientists and psychologists who are available on the market. One of them, which I might mention, is British Psychological Society, which invests their time and resources in looking into the documents that uh, assessors or, or creators of assessment tools provide, and they evaluate it for those people who actually are not familiar with that, who have not studied five years of psychology just to, <laughs> just to be able to, to pick an assessment. So they are, they are making the, the life easier for every one of us. And one of the things you should be looking for when you're looking at, at an assessment tool is a standardization of the assessment. You want it to be transparent. You don't want to have some sort of shady business behind that. You want it to be the same for everybody so that it treats men and women equally, so that um, it has clear instructions that are given to everybody in the very same manner. Uh, a part of that, there is a technical documentation behind that uh, that is available if you request it. And it's not just marketing materials, uh, but it's providing a very detailed information about the construction of the tool, the reasoning, why the tool uh, is needed on the, or for the purpose, and then it can really do the job. And something you all might be familiar is a thing called norms. It's basically a collection of data with which you are comparing your participants because you don't know if, if you collect 20 points on something, what does it mean? Is it too much? Is it too little? Is it an average? You need to compare someone uh, or you need to compare your candidate or your employee with a group of population who, um, who comes from the same environment so that you know if the person is doing much better or much worse or about the average as the others. Uh, the data uh, in such norm should be reasonably big, at least in hundreds, ideally in thousands. Some of the uh, most uh, modern or advanced even have hundreds of thousands data in their norm, uh, which, is, which is kind of um, 
amazing uh, to see that they collected so much information. But not only that, uh, the, the data should be actual. They should be from past years, not from 1950s. Uh, because then you would be comparing your candidate with workers from 1950s, and I'm not sure if that's what you really want. So be sure to look at these uh, at these materials. Ask for them. Uh, they should be available. Uh, there shouldn't be any any excuses. I'm sorry, we are working on these. No, if if you want to use it, you have to have your norms. You have to have your technical documentation, and you have to have a solid scientific background. There are certain characteristics which might now sound a bit boring and, and uninteresting, but they are, they are two magic words you should always be looking for when it comes to uh, some sort of assessment, and that's reliability and validity. Reliability is basically uh, how, to what degree I can rely on the results. Imagine I would uh, wake up in the morning, uh, step on, on my personal scale, and see a value, and then in the evening, after a usual day, I would see a double value. I might have had a great lunch, or the scale is broken. And I would rather hope that the scale is broken because nobody can double their weight over a day. And that's the same what we expect from a personality assessment. We expect it to give us a stable result because personality also doesn't change overnight. And if, you, if I complete it on Monday morning, on Friday afternoon, at Christmas or uh, on my birthday, there shouldn't be massive discrepancies between the, the evaluations. It should be providing uh, kind of realistic results in time. Of course, people can change over time, but uh, reasonable assessments give reliable results up to several years, so you can still rely on the data collected on day one, even after a year or even after two years when you're modeling uh, or, or preparing someone's adaptation plan or development plan, or if you want to promote someone, you still should be able to rely on the data and you don't have to ask your participants to do it twice a week. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of efforts that get wasted. And even more important than reliability, that means the stability of results is also the the fact that it measures what I wanted to measure. Maybe my scale wasn't measuring my, my weight, maybe my scale was measuring temperature, or maybe it was just um, a random value. I need to know what I'm measuring because uh, the, 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 the assessments tell us that they describe something, that they describe our future behavior. But do they really? That's the way uh, how, how we take it or, or what's important about validity. Validity in personality assessments most of the times is the ability to predict future, like a looking in a crystal ball in a very limited way. But I want to see that if my candidate has a certain results which describe him or her in one way or another, I want this candidate to behave this way and succeed because of this behavior in their role after half a year after a year and that's what you all mentioned that it works in the long term it's not just one snapshot for one moment personality assessments typically uh take our kind of our natural uh, things that are natural to us our underlining motives something that out of the out of the black box which is very hard to uh, to evaluate or hard to understand the personality because nobody has, has ever really seen a human's personality. But what we can observe is behavior. And if we are able to predict certain behavior, then we are happy because then the tool is doing for us what we want. We want to predict if he or she or, or another candidate will be successful in the job or if or who of my uh, coworkers has the biggest potential to succeed in a certain role. And that's a very important part of quality of assessments. And look for that. Uh, information about reliability and validity should always be available. And uh, the British Psychological Society evaluates uh, globally available assessments 
on, on a very easy star uh, level model. So the more stars you get, the better result. You don't actually have to care about the, the real statistic numbers. But look at look at this because this will uh, this will help you to differentiate between the the more effective and less effective tools on the market because we are always speaking about the costs and energy you invest in using it and also uh, your um, your people in the organization if they feel that the tools you're using don't really work for them uh, it's not really the way you you uh, will keep them happy and motivated if they see it works if they see the added value in that it even increases their motivation to succeed so um, I'm, I'm trying to kind of plant a seed in your minds when it comes to thinking about reliable or, or reasonable assessments because you're spending efforts. You still want to be connected with your people and still continue on your processes because the world cannot stop. We still have to move on, but we can't take just anything to, uh, to make things happen. Uh, we have to think carefully about what we choose. And um, one of the, or that's my specialty and, and, and kind of the, the uh, my, my most favorite thing at my work is working with Hogan assessments. Uh, because these are, um, from these perspectives, uh, objective way of, of evaluation uh, of the quality of the tools are given a stellar results. Uh, they are kind of a combination or, or they come from a scientific background. Uh, there's over 100 people who are constantly, even now at this very moment, working on it to improve it, to uh, make it up to date uh, and to do the job for you that you're looking for. And by the way, in most of the countries where Assessment Systems Group operates, uh, Hogan was the very first online tool available. <laughs> Before that, there was a high, um, high skepticism against it. Uh, people still wanted to control the assessment and do it paper and pencil way, but it saves lots of costs. It, you can do it on your mobile phone on your way to work <laughs> if you want and you have the results immediately there's no need to rescore it they, there's no need to wait for results everything is available immediately which in these moments we expect it to be that way but only a couple of years ago it, it really hasn't been like that so I'm speaking about Hogan. So what is Hogan? For those of you who have never heard about it, I will be more than happy to introduce you uh, or, or let you know how these things work in real life in case you are not familiar with Hogan and, and you would like to try it out. Be sure to let us know and we will happily uh, guide you through that and explain that to you more. But generally, when we speak about Hogan assessments, what it is, um, what, what to expect from it, Hogan is, um, is a personality assessment tool, one of the first uh, that actually have been created for the organizational context. Before that, uh, even the clinical assessments that measure uh, clinical aspects of personality were used in the organizational context. And, and Hogan was one of the first who realized that you don't really need to know that. You need to know other things to be able to predict someone's behavior. And it consists of three parts. They are called HPI, HDS, and MBPI. I'm sorry to those of you who are familiar with that and for whom I will be repeating it for 10th time uh, already. But I really like this picture because it, it kind of nicely connects the dots together. HPI, the first assessment out of Hogan assessments, is a measure of day-to-day -day behavior. It's basically what kind of strengths and, and, and uh, what kind of skills and competencies you have to get things done, to accomplish your goals. What kind of worker you will be on a daily basis? Will you be energetic? Will you be shy? Will you be hardworking? Will you be pragmatic? All these things will be answered by the first assessment. But, and, it's, and we like to call it the bright side of personality. But a very important part uh, of our life uh, happens when we are stressed. Uh, even if we want it or, or not, everybody gets stressed at times. 
And that's why we have Hogan Development Survey, a way to measure how someone will behave uh, when they are stressed, when they are, uh, when things don't go as expected, when they will be facing a conflict, when they will be too tired or too hungry or, or both. And they will try to um, manage the situation. Um, we need to know who they become when they are stressed. And that's why we call the assessment the dark side of personality. And the third one, MVPI, is the inside because it's a lot about values, what motivates us, what gets us out of the bed in the morning so that we go to work, uh, what kind of environment we enjoy being in, what kind of people we like, what kind of job we will like, what makes the, the, the important things and the priorities in our life. And that's MVPI. These three things are kind of combined together, underlying, underlining the personality, which gives us the ability to predict future performance. When we connect the three together, we might say that MVPI is what kind of goals we will have in our life, what will be the, be the priority, the way where we want to go. HPI is what kind of skills we will have to accomplish our goals. And HDS is what will stand in our way to the goals. So uh, a really nice and useful combination, um, which has just just speaking very briefly, you can, it's available on the internet free, uh, you, can, you can freely download it or we will be happy to share it with you, has recently had a really stellar review on the quality of assessments by British Psychological Society. And more things to mention that are specific about Hogan, because you might be thinking, well, that's another tool on the market. Why should I care about Hogan? Why, why not something else? Um, the specialty of Hogan, one of them is measuring the stress-related behavior, which is quite unique. And a lot, of, a lot of assessments kind of ignore that or forget about that. But a lot of times we become someone really different uh, when we are stressed. The other thing is that we are measuring reputation. Uh, that means our behavior in the eyes of others, what others will likely say about us, because that's an important part uh, for organizational context. I'm not going to promote someone because he or she thinks he is the right fit for a promotion. I will promote this person because there is a consensus. The reputation of this person is that he can do it. He can be promoted. And that's a very important part of the aspect uh, of measuring uh, someone's behavior. Sometimes we like to think of ourselves the best and we kind of ignore uh, the worst. But the way Hogan measures our behavior and personality is through reputation. That means through the eyes of others, which makes it very unique. Um, and a part of that, of course, there's a lot of years of research that has been uh, given and invested into Hogan. Um, every day they, they have that Kaizen approach to improve their psych psychometrics through small steps, but continually. And uh, they are, their tools is created to predict the future performance or help you identify people uh, who have the potential to succeed when they will be promoted, or when they will be given new opportunities, kind of uh, the career pathing or, or succession planning in your organization. So we have heard that, uh, that Hogan is also very, very uh, flexible because you can complete it online, on the way, or wherever you are. And I think uh, flexibility can be our key word today, because as you have heard, it is also a competence that is required in this new world. And it is also something uh, that is important in the eyes of, uh, of, uh, of candidates. Uh, according to this study, 22% of talent professionals say workplace flexibility is important for recruiting. So we, we not only need to seek for people who are flexible, but we need to show that we are flexible as employers. And how, what is the best way to show that? It is that, uh, that the recruiting process is flexible in itself. So 
why not do everything online? Because you, that, you can do that at home, you can do that uh, during uh, your travels or, or wherever. So we should keep flexibility in our minds if we want to improve our employer branding or candidate experience, for example. Uh, and we can do that uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, this, uh, with a personality assessment that is online. So for example, Hogan Tools. But can we do that uh, with assessment centers? Can we move assessment centers online? Yes, <laughs> we can. Uh, and if we want to seem as a flexible company, we would like to encourage you to, to move uh, your assessment centers online. Uh, however, what you need to know is that uh, an online assessment center is not just an assessment center that is done online. We should consider it a completely different assessment tool uh, because it is meant to measure observable behavior and it is known uh, and scientific data is also behind that, that when we are behaving in the online space, for example, when I am behaving here in front of you, right now in the online space, I behave differently than I would normally. So uh, as we say that an offline or traditional assessment center is meant to measure observable behavior, we also say that an online assessment center is meant to measure online observable behavior. So if we are recruiting someone for a, a mainly online position, we should use an online, online assessment center because that is for measuring their behavior and per performance in the online space. And it is also a very, very nice and valid tool to measure digital skills. And it is also flexible. So if we, we want to show our candidates that we are a flexible company, we need to give the opportunity to them to, to do the whole hiring process from their homes, the flexibility of their homes. And they can, if they can do the assessments online, this is the best way to do that. Um, however, uh, we still recommend you to use both uh, assessment methods. So if you use an online assessment center, we highly recommend you to use the Hogan or a personality uh, assessment or what uh, an assessment that is meant to measure underlying characteristics. Uh, because uh, there are very few jobs that are only done online. And an online assessment center is, is best to predict online behavior, but yes, we still need to see the potential of the person, of the competencies uh, in general. And the more, the better. So if we use more assessment methods that, of course, uh, show in the same direction and not measure completely different things, but measure same things, we will reach the most uh, precise and accurate data and prediction in the end. And since we are speaking about uh, the assessment of future competencies or the competencies of the new normal of the VUCA world or whatever we are living in right now, uh, it, is, it is a very high uh, need or requirement uh, regarding the analytical thinking skills uh, adaptability and flexibility and how we measure that with uh, of course with Hogan tools but if we want to measure it with assessment centers as well uh, the traditional way of assessment centers are good we are we are also conducting that of course uh, but if we really want to measure adaptability flexibility uh, and analytical skills and uh, being able to adapt to new circumstances or being able to make decisions in a, in a changing environment, we should give our participants or candidates an environment that simulates the world we are living in right now. Uh, we are very proud uh, that we have this uh, additional tool for our assessment centers, which is called business simulation. And we also recommend it for our clients uh, if they want to seem as a, as a digital and innovative and a useful company, because that is also very important if, if you find uh, employer branding and can be candidate experience important, you, you need to show it during your selection uh, methods. Uh, what is a business simulation? A business simulation is, is an application uh, that is uh, cloud-based uh, and uh, we can say it's a gamified business scenario with, with serious cons uh, consequences. So it's not a gamification because you face 
lifelike challenges. Uh, we like to use the setup where you need to lead a startup company, uh, lead to it to new markets and uh, to success. You need to conquer new markets, you need to implement a new uh, product, but there are several other setups as well. So it really depends on our client's requirements and the competencies we want to assess. But what is similar is that these business simulations uh, give us a lifelike environment where the person needs to make lifelike decisions uh, with very lifelike consequences. And it is very, um, uh, very um, flexible and very, very in time because uh, if we use the traditional business case studies that are usually paper based, we don't really see the consequences of the person's decision and we don't give the opportunity for them to be able to learn from their decisions on spot. And if we use a business simulation, we can see that how they can adapt to even to, to bad decisions, will they, will they uh, lead to the company to success in the end? But of course, it's uh, usually not our goal uh, to see the candidates uh, to, to reach profit in this business simulation or to, to make the company prosperous, but the way they are, they are thinking. So we want to uh, usually like to ask them to, to put their thoughts on speakers so we can say, see uh, if they are thinking and behaving the way our competencies require. So if we want to measure future competencies, we need to use future assessment method like a business simulation during an assessment center. Uh, and um, last but not least, uh, we wanted to show you a case study. Uh, why is it important to use uh, these two kinds of assessment methods? So first of all, for example, an assessment center that targets the observable behavior or makes a snapshot of what the person can do currently. And also another assessment like Holden assessment methods that measure the underlying characteristics, whether the person has the potential to behave in the required way. Uh, we had a case study with uh, our client in, in FMCG or retail. Uh, we couldn't, or, or I couldn't really decide which is the most uh, significant, but that's not the topic right now. It was a sales assessment and we used both uh, an, a development center and Hogan tools as well. Uh, Hogan is also very flexible to, to map uh, competencies so we can align the competencies measured during an assessment center with the competencies measured by Hogan. So we can make uh, something like this very nice developmental matrix in the end where we can put candidates in and check uh, what kind of development uh, they are needing. So for example, here you can say on, uh, see on the X axis, uh, which were the results of, uh, or which was the scale for the DC competencies. And on the Y axis, you can see the scale uh, for the Hogan competency result. So for example, if the candidate received high scores on both of these assessment methods, they, they were very, very good. They were high potentials, so basically no further development uh, was needed. But for example, if they uh, received a lower score on DC competency results, but a higher score on Hogan competency results, it showed that they have the potential, they just lacking something uh, that, um, that is needed for them to, to show uh, these competencies in behavior. So they need something uh, in, in theory. So they did something about sales or the products or whatever. And uh, on the other hand, if they showed high results on DC competencies but lower results on Hogan, that means that uh, they had uh, the ability to show the behavior that is needed. So they, they learned it or they, they used some compensators or they were aware that they are lacking something in their personality and they already tried to work on that. Uh, but they still needed uh, some assistance in that. So in these cases, we uh, advised them or advised our clients to send these people to some practice oriented development or training where they can also uh, also uh, use their potential or increase their potential regarding these competencies.
So we are reaching our time limit. We have five remaining minutes. I see that some of you already asked questions. We will have a time for that in, in a moment. So feel free in case there is any questions we haven't answered so far, write it in the question and answer uh, option of Zoom. And let's wrap it up. Let's see what we walked through today. What, uh, what are the key uh, thoughts we wanted to share with you? Well, unsurprisingly, use of any sort of assessment is still important. We can't just wait until all the situation is over. The situation might be over, but the world world will remain changed. So we need to adapt and we need to use relevant tools uh, that will do the job for us, that will be fair and that will be reasonable uh, to use. And um, when it comes to thinking what types of tools or assessments we should use, we should always also keep in mind of combining them together because combining the tools together increases our ability to predict things. That's for example why we have several different exercises in an AC so that we give the participants a chance to show us the, the skills, the behavior they have. Doing assessment center with just one activity wouldn't really do the job for us. And uh, last but not least, uh, what we see and also what the data show us is that still the core competencies are the same. We still need the essential skills to succeed in our life. They are just becoming more important in the uh, online space because there's a bigger uh, chance because it's a new environment for a lot of us. Uh, there's a higher chance that we will fail. We will make a mistake. We are, we are not used to that. There is a higher amount of stress that makes us derail, that makes us make mistakes. And that's why even now we need uh, the right people on the right places. So let's have a look at the questions. And I see that uh, one of them was upvoted. You mentioned online, uh, we can measure virtual behavior. I have difficulty to separate this in my mind. Why virtual behaviors and competencies would be different than what we measure on a face-to-face -face assessment? Well, um, maybe Dora would, would like to uh, comment on this. My thought on this would be that uh, virtual behavior has different standards and different kind of rules, how it works. We cannot be natural to each other. We don't see uh, a lot of information is lost in, in this style of communication. Uh, we also um, have to organize our work in a different way. We are unable to read the, read the clues. We cannot come to a colleague in the office and ask the questions. We have to reach out. A lot of my friends complained that they are not learning anymore when they work home because they don't hear others speaking and and they don't have a chance to hear or contribute and uh and therefore uh there is diff there is a different context there are different um, there's a different pace of work different prioritization that uh kind of influences that and therefore uh moving the evaluation to the area or, or to the place where the, the the behavior will be important is is important and essential yeah would I have, you like to add anything yeah just very quickly uh that unfortunately there is not a large amount of research in that but there is some uh and uh, and uh, according to those findings it seems that people tend to uh, tend to behave differently when they are communicating in video video uh, conferencing so for example if you just uh, think about that you are uh, you are being in a face-to-face -face situation with, with someone and you want to be empathetic with the other person because you are an empathetic person uh, by yourself as well and you you want to pay attention not uh, necessarily consciously but unconsciously to to how they behave their non-verbal cues how they are sitting uh how how they are where they are looking uh, and, and stuff like that. And you just can't do that on the online space. You can't even see where I am looking. So just you just can't uh, show the interpersonal competencies to, to this to similar extent in the online space than you would virtually. So that is very, very different. 
and participants uh, that uh, attended our online ACs already, they also also say that, that it is very hard for them when, when we ask them to, to do role plays, to sh show empathy, to pay attention to the other person because, because they are just feeling something is lacking. They, they want to feel the nonverbal cues, the presence of the other person and which you can't even see that, for example, where my legs are, where my toes are pointing and they, these are just basic body language and there are also a lot of other things that are missing in the online space. So, we seem to have run out of time. Thank you all for participating. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the session here. Uh, we will be sending you a recording uh, of this webinar in case you, you weren't here at the beginning or you would like to share it with someone. And of course, feel free to reach out anytime uh, to us in case you would like to see how it all works, to have a demo access, to uh, get to know something more about, about things that we just introduced. Or if you would just like to have a coffee and a discussion about this topic, we will be more, of course, virtually, we will be more than happy to speak to you again. We wish you a great uh, rest of the day uh, and, and a lot of success. Uh, when working virtually and moving people on the virtual level. Thank you very much for your attention and being there.